I was like, oh. And it's, I know like Jack's solo sessions are always so awesome, but sorry, you guys now have to put up with me again. <laughs> um, and we would love to see if anybody has a case who are, who's willing to present. Uh, please volunteer. Any case is a good case. And I'm just going to pass the mic to Jack to say hi. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back. Um, I hope everyone is having a great week. And uh, yeah, it feels, uh, I feel very warm and happy uh, to be back co-piloting these Wednesdays with the great Charmise. If you do have a case, please do volunteer to present. We are, we are. Um, uh, I was gonna say on the hunt for one, but wanna use a better, uh, less, less violent uh, metaphor. So okay, we are, we are, we are in search, uh, in search of a case. <laughs> Love it. Doesn't have to be a like fully firm closed case either. Um, can be something common, something esoteric. Uh, any case is a good case. Hey everyone, I've got a case if you want uh, to hear my voice again. Knew it! Hi friends, how have you been? Hey Charmaine, uh, I'm good. I wanted to listen to someone else's case today, but I'm happy to present if there's nobody who has one. Oh, thank you, love. We always appreciate you. And love, Thanks, love. is one of, is a dear friend and also my co-resident back in the day. Uh, absolutely, love. If you don't mind, that would be awesome. Sure. Uh, do you want me to get started? Or I guess you guys need a discussion, right? Uh, I think Jack and I were with, uh, we will tag team it. Yeah, which sounds yeah. good. All right, uh, the chief concern is uh, uh, progressive lower extremity edema. Do you want me to keep going or stop there? Uh, why don't you go ahead and keep going? Okay, uh, it's an, um, 65 year old woman uh, who had um, a smoking history, but otherwise nothing major, who um, over the last month and a half has noticed that her legs have started to swell uh, more. Never had this before, and just noticed that it started bothering her. She had no other uh, fevers or chills, no trouble breathing. Uh, no um, uh, redness, no warmth of the legs. She went to go see her doctor a couple of weeks ago for it. They didn't figure anything out. And eventually came to the hospital for her to try to figure out what was going on. All right. Um, well, let's see, I will... Um, uh... I will kick us off here. You know, I think um, many of us are probably familiar or maybe familiar with sort of like with the general approach to lower extremity edema. There's really three, um, three organ systems that come into play when we think about um, potential drivers of lower extremity edema, the heart, the liver and the kidneys. And then one other one that can, um, that can, that can sometimes come into play, particularly after we falsified those first three primary organs is gonna be the thyroid. In that case, it's not necessarily gonna be lower extremity edema, um, but we might actually see mixed edema, um, uh, particularly in the anterior shins. Um, and that can be sometimes difficult to distinguish from just um, general run of the mill, lower extremity edema. So that sort of can sit in, in the back of our mind here. And then I would say, you know, while those four organ systems occupy a lot of our cognitive energy in clinical reasoning cases like this, far and away the most common cause of new lower extremity edema, particularly in somebody who's getting 
up into the age of 50 or 60 years is just going to be chronic venous stasis. Settling on the diagnosis of chronic venous stasis and venous insufficiency um, oftentimes requires passing through those three to four organ systems, again, the heart, the liver, and the kidneys. Um, but I think from, from, from a base rate perspective, that is going to sort of occupy the highest probabilistic space. Um, but there are some features that we might look for to help give us clues to whether or not the heart is on the hook, whether or not the kidneys are on the hook, and whether or not the liver is on the hook. And I'll kick that over to Charmaine to take us through more about what you're thinking about this. Oh yeah, I absolutely love it. I think, you know, the three most common things would be like cardiac, liver, and renal to investigate. And I love the thought about like the venous insufficiency and thyroid, thyroid can do anything. Um, I think uh, after that, the other two things that I think about are medications, you know, amlodipine is notorious one, gabapentin at higher doses, pregabalin, they're all associated with bilateral lower extremity edema as well. And then just to make sure I don't forget um, I always think about, you know, proximal issues that like maybe involving the IVC or, you know, a mimicker of um, that, like a, lymph, uh, a mimicker of like, what we think about like water in the soft tissue would be like lymphedema. Uh, so those are the things that also it's going to be in the back of my mind as we go through the case. Love, would he, love to hear more. Sounds good. Um, so the patient has no past medical history and doesn't take any medications at all. Uh, no uh, family history of cancer uh, or blood clots or heart disease uh, that she knows about. Uh, she immigrated from uh, Japan a couple of decades ago and has lived in uh, San Francisco uh, ever since then, uh, lives with uh, the, her partner. Uh, she smokes um, probably, or is down to about five to six cigarettes now from uh, probably about a 20 to 30 pack year history uh, before. No recent travel at all. Uh, no allergies to any medications that she knows about. Do you want me to keep going with exam? Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, vitals are all completely normal. Uh, on exam, a very, very well uh, appearing uh, person who could have been at a doctor, normal doctor's visit. Um, no uh, lymphadenopathy in anywhere in the head or neck region. Uh, no jaundice, no scleral icterus. Uh, heart exam is regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs. No uh, crackles on lung exam, clear bilaterally. Abdomen is completely soft. Uh, for neuro is uh, oriented times three completely normal gross sort of neuro exam. And extremities has two plus pitting edema to just above the knees, worse at the feet uh, and progressively getting a little bit better up. Oh, all right. Uh, so I'll just like uh, tackle a little bit of the background and then pass the uh, pass the mic to uh, Jack for uh, his thoughts on the exam. So you know, with like the minimum past medical history, I think we've like talked about it before. Whenever I see that, I think of like. Uh, the question that comes to my mind is this patient who's been in care or not? Uh, has this patient has been seen the doctor regularly or, you know, she has some chronic conditions that has yet to be manifested um, or has she has an, uh, that has not been able to be caught? Uh, and like with meds as well, just, uh, you know, thinking about supplement and other things to ask as well. And the one thing that... Uh, is the the past medical history a portion uh, is noted for is the smoking history and just to kind of think about like smoking exposure and why it can um, uh, like especially the significant smoking history that she has what do we usually think about you know in terms of like usually think about like lung pathologies right most commonly like COPD uh, and cancer are being the two. Um, that are associated with it. Uh, you know, chronically uh, smoking can also lead to ILD. Um, the other, and then apart from lung, uh, 
uh, there are other things associated like vascular um, abnormalities and vascular side effects. And in addition to cancers, that is not just lung, like renal is another one to uh, think about. Um, so, you know, the reason why I'm just thinking about that is because she has a significant exposure history and there's like nothing else uh, in the background. So I figured it's a good thing to keep in mind as going forward. Um, Jack, what are your thoughts on the exam? I love that, Charmise. I think you know, looking looking at the exam, I think it's notable both for sort of the confirmation of some of the findings that we were exploring in the HPI, but then also the notable absence of other features. I think when whenever we're evaluating a patient who has lower extremity edema and we get to the exam portion, um, uh, I draw on a framework that Robbie introduced during VMR uh, probably a few years ago, which is that when you see lower extremity edema on exam, look up. And the first place that we can look up to is gonna be into the abdominal area. And then the second place that we can look up to is gonna be into the neck area, because that can really help us to, to evaluate for the probability of one of these different, different, different organ systems being on the hook. For example, if we look and see that there's pitting lower extremity edema and we look up into the abdomen and we see that there's ascites in that area, it drastically increases the probability of underlying portal hypertension um, and hepatic dysfunction, for example, in the setting of cirrhosis as the cause. If we look up still though, because when we can see, when we see ascites in the abdomen, it doesn't necessarily clinch the diagnosis of a primary hepatic problem because we can certainly develop ascites, for example, from congestive hepatopathy in the setting of decompensated heart failure. So the next place that we can look up to is gonna be into the neck. And if we see elevated JVP, right, that further supports a cardiac hypothesis, whereas the absence of JVP tells us that maybe um, that, um, that at least the, the filling pressures into the right atrium of, of the heart are not particularly high. And so if we then take that framework and map it onto what we see in front of us here on the exam, right, we see that there is not a, a prominent signature of elevated cardiac filling, filling pressures because we don't hear about there being a mark of the elevated JVD. We don't see that there's a signature of, of ascites here. So we're, we are, um, uh, it seems like it's unlikely that we're dealing with portal hypertension. And then noting that not all individuals with underlying cirrhosis may manifest um, signs of we also don't see other stigmata of chronic liver disease. For example, we don't see things like caput medusa. You don't have features of palmar erythema or spider angiomas. So I think what this exam helps us do is if we think about those three organs, it increases the probability of a potential renal cause of lower extremity edema just based off of the base rate of disease and um, continues to support the possibility of what we said from the beginning, something like chronic venous stasis and venous insufficiency. Now we are in a clinical problem solving exercise, right? So we may expect that the venous insufficiency is likely to fall off the DX or the DDX act as, as, um, as other data unfolds, but right, practically in, in the authentic environment, this exam is totally compatible with something like new chronic venous insufficiency. And I saw that Josh was asking in the chat about some other clues to that, for example, like brawny, brawny discoloration, which is a great point here. I will say in terms of the renal hypothesis, one thing that I'm tempered by here is the fact that there are normal vital signs, right? In things, um, in renal diseases that can lead to the, the development of lower extremity edema, for example, progressive CKD or glomerulonephritis or nephrotic syndrome, right? We might expect to see hypertension um, as a part of that clinical syndrome. That hypertension is gonna be much more prominent in the setting of something like glomerulonephritis compared to other things like for example, nephrotic syndrome. But I think that is that is maybe um, while the exam may put a point or, or a couple points in the renal column, um, the vital signs here maybe put a couple points away from the renal column, for example, given that there is the absence of hypertension. Of course, this is all conjecture until we explore some of the more targeted data like the renal panel and the UA, but this is some of the way that the exam is helping to frame probabilities here. Again, I think cardiac becomes less likely, hepatic disease becomes less likely, Renal probably could be becomes more likely just by virtue of the vacuum that's left by the falsification of those other two hypotheses. And then certainly venous stasis and those other diseases that Charmine mentioned originally, particularly things like central venous obstruction, um, uh, uh, I think are still at least on the hook um, if these other hypotheses fall off. All right, Lev, take us forward here. I'm excited to see where this goes. Right. Um, you should assume that, because um, there's going to be a lot of data, you should assume that if I don't say anything, it's just normal. 
uh, CBC was normal. Uh, on the chemistry panel, the sodium was 120, potassium 3.5, uh, chloride normal, CO2 normal, BUN normal, creatinine normal, glucose normal, calcium phos mag all normal. LFT is all normal. Albumin is about 2.6. Uh, I forget what the EKG showed, apologies. Uh, on X-ray, uh, it completely clear lungs. And then on bedside ultrasound, when trying to evaluate the patient, uh, was noted to have a moderate pericardial effusion. I'll stop there. All right. Hmm. So. Uh, oh, so I should give you one more piece of data so we don't, because we don't have that much time. Uh, the UA was completely normal, no okay. protein. <laughs> that was, <laughs> love you read my mind. That was like where my brain was going. Um, all right, so let's see what we have. So we have a 65-year-old um, woman with no significant past medical history, um, who's sure of active smoking, who is presenting with about a subacute bilateral lower extremity edema found to have hyponatremia, hypoalbuminemia, and a moderate pericardial effusion on uh, ultrasound. So um, I think the part about the hypoalbuminemia uh, is the one that uh, I'm going to tackle first. Uh, and the reason why is that my brain is still trying to figure out, okay, this patient's complaint was lower extremity edema and hypoalbuminemia is one of the reasons why you can have a fluid going into the wrong places. So when I think about like hypoalbuminemia, um, I think about two things. One is what causes us to have decreased production or increased loss. And um, a lot of the ones that uh, uh, with the loss and the reason why I love was like jumped up and said the you it was normal is that we worry about like nephrotic syndrome. And a lot of the time nephrotic syndrome, you can have initially like normal um, a creatinine with uh, especially some of the diseases that lead to nephrotic syndrome. I always say, you know, you just like your troponin, you can repeat it. Um, none of our tests are perfect. So if I'm really puzzled, that's the test that I will repeat at some point. So when it comes to the decreased production, any causes of inflammation um, can cause any, especially chronic infl inflammation, any chronic diseases over time that cause decreased hypoalbuminemia, especially in the setting of decreased PO intake. Um, and then the other one is like a liver disease, right? Uh, so any liver synthetic dysfunction, we don't see any evidence of synthetic dysfunction. I would assume like the INR, the platelets and everything else are normal. Um, and rare causes of hypoalbumin would be like the uh, decrease, uh, any, I think like with any genetic or I think that would uh, cause uh, um, decreased uh, creation of albumin. But again, like at 65, I would not anticipate that being the first presentation. Um, and for increased loss, we talked about the nephrotic syndrome and the other ones to think about are like protein losing anthropathy. So we didn't really hear a history compatible with that, but that is something to keep in mind or any causes of like vascular leak, um, which I don't um, see here as well. So I guess um, I'm a little puzzled by the help of albuminemia. So my thoughts would be like, hey, is there any reasons for the chronic inflammation um, that we haven't seen yet? Um, is there any losses? Like I would like think about more about like the protein losing anthropathies um, as well. Um, and in terms of like the moderate pericardial effusion, my one thought is that like, hey, if she's putting fluids in her legs, is that just, fluids that it goes, uh, that is contributing, um, that is the same base, the same process, just like, you know, if she could have pleural effusion, she has a pericardial effusion, or um, is, is it a consequence of the hypoalbuminemia, or is it part of the syndrome um, that is presenting? And I think the pericardial effusion, whenever I see it, 
uh, especially on the echo, I would get a formal echo to make sure there's no sign of tamponade. Um, and it sounds like she's like doing well, but again, that is something that you want to think about more or whether like tapping it would be helpful um, in terms of diagnostic purposes. Um, and, you know, I can see a hyponatremia and not pass the mic to Jack because I know it's his favorite. So that's my gift to you, my friends. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I am a neutremia file. Um, uh, I think, you know, I mean, your reason there is flawless. And I think that um, the question here about whether or not the pericardial effusion is a, is, is, is a key feature of the signature of whatever disease that we're going to diagnose versus the consequence of, of whatever, um, what, whatever pathophysiologic abnormalities have been sort of set in motion by the disease is such, such a, a brilliant point. If we just double click on the hyponatremia here and sort of try to explore it, I think you know um, we can we can use um, different studies to explore the to explore the underlying possible likelihood um, of the causes of hyponatremia. Right? We can look to our serum to confirm whether that that this is indeed hypo um, uh, hypoosmolar hyponatremia, which we have no no reason to suspect it's not. There's not a clinical signature of hyperglycemia. Uh, there's not a clear signature of a recent paraproteinemia or something that could cause pseudohyponatremia. We'll then look to the urinosomes to get a sense of whether or not ADH is on or off. If the urinosomes are high within like the mid to high hundreds, that tells us that that ADH is on, which I which is most likely, I think what we're gonna see here, we don't have in the background things that can cause a low urinosome hyponatremia, things like a TNTOS diet or beer potomania or primary polydipsia. Once we've established whether or not ADH is on or off, it if if it, it is on and those urino urinosomes are high, we can turn our attention to the urine sodium here. A urine sodium that's very, very low suggests that both ADH and aldosterone are on, which means that those two hormones are appropriately coming together, which we can see in the setting of a low effective arterial blood volume. That's oftentimes the finding in the presence of profound hypovolemia or profound hypervolemia, like heart failure or cirrhosis. It doesn't seem, just based off of the exam, the probability of low effective arterial blood volume seems low, right? We don't have evidence of volume overload or hypovolemia on exam, and we have relatively stable vital signs, right? So I think um, while to while I am open to the possibility that the urine or that that the urine sodium may be quite low, we may be dealing with a picture here where we have a high urine sodium and potentially high urinosomes just based off of the features of the history and the exam here. Once we're in that category, right, ADH is on and then aldosterone is off, that tells us that ADH is inappropriately on for one of several reasons. That could be related to something like adrenal insufficiency, although we don't have things like hypotension, abdominal pain, or modest eosinophilia here, or possibly something like hypothyroidism. The hypothyroidism hypothesis becomes interesting here because um, hypothyroidism in its severe state can present with pericardial effusions as well. However, other features of severe hypothyroidism aren't particularly prominent. We don't have things like profound fatigue. We don't have things like coarse, uh, coarse or brittle hair. We don't have severe lethargy. And the edema that we see is primarily in the lower extremities rather than, um, rather than anastarka, which we can sometimes see in severe hypothyroidism. So the TSH will be helpful here, but our illness script is maybe not matching on perfectly for that. After we think about adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism, the other potential causes of, of that, um, of that um, uh, uh, inappropriate ADH elevation include things like certain medications, which we see that she's not taking, things like pain or anxiety, which is something that we may want to explore more to see if that could be a cause here. And then other things that can cause, S, that, that can cause SIADH, for example, underlying malignancy. And in addition to hypothyroidism, malignancy becomes into the play here for the reasons that Charmin mentioned earlier. We have prominent risk factors with the smoking history and the 20 to pack year smoking history, and then also the finding of the pericardial effusion. Understanding the etiology of a pericardial effusion um, uh, oftentimes requires us to sample it if we want to get a definitive diagnosis, unless there's a clear reason for someone to have it based off of the past medical history. Clear reasons that we sometimes encounter are, for example, the presence of thoracic cancer, like lung cancer, breast cancer, or underlying lymphomas, none of which we see in the background here, but which may be a, a possible diagnoses that we're yet to discover um, in this case. 
We can also see things like in the post-acute myocardial infarction setting, we can see sort of a post, uh, post-infarction um, post um, myocarditis, which we don't have evidence of in the background. And then other things that can do it, like we mentioned, are underlying CKD or underlying hypothyroidism. The former, we don't see features of, and the latter, we can at least go on to explore later. So overall, right, based off of what, what Charmin took us through in terms of how we can think about this pericardial effusion, and then layering that onto the features we have here for the exam, um, it seems like there's maybe some sense that we might be dealing with a SIADH type picture, whether that's from adrenal disease, thyroid disease, or one of the other causes of SIADH, like malignancy, um, is still yet to be determined. But at least thyroid disease and cancer are both ways to potentially say, this could drive the hyponatremia, and this could drive the new pericardial effusion, um, the cancers being thoracic malignancies or hematologic malignancies. And then it's important not to forget to think about breast cancers, um, particularly because they can be image negative, at least with the imaging that we typically use in the inpatient setting. Awesome. I'm going to, I've, as you were asking for things, I was just typing. So I'm just going to hit enter. And that's the result to all the things you had. So I'll let you read it in the chat. And for those of you who may watch on YouTube later, I will um, read these out. Um, so we have a normal TSH, a high urine sodium of 70, a high urine osm of 400, no pain no anxiety. Um, the pericardial effusion is unfortunately not, not, not able to be tapped, and the TTE shows no evidence of tamponade, and there is good cardiac function. All right, Charmise, what do you think? Oh, yes. I think uh, I loved all of your thoughts. Um, so as I'm like thinking, uh, and you nailed it, as you were also talking, uh, I was like, okay, how are these can be all related to each other? And I think thinking about like malignancy, um, I think is a good thought. Um, and especially, you know, thinking about like, this is like SIDH, um, most likely uh, as a driver uh, for this. And I think uh, uh, folks put out the causes of protein losing anthropathies and thinking about the smoking, head and neck cancers, gastric cancers, pancreatic cancers, like those things that all, all can potentially lead to hypoalbuminemia um, as well. Um, I think that's one thing that I would consider. The other thing that I would, think about again going back to why she presented on lower extremity edema and just not to anchor on the hypoalbuminemia on its own is that uh, if we again uh, just it's just a hypothesis, but if we are worried about possibly hypercoagulable state, and then thinking about a more central clot, either uh, I ran in the setting of a, uh, you know, someone with normal creatinine, this is the person that I think we need more data. So I want to look at the chest and I want to look at the belly at least um, to see, you know, what is there any like diffuse lymphadenopathies, is there anything that we can mind? And most of the GI specific things, we're not going to be able to diagnose, uh, not all of them with a CT, uh, like endoscopy and those things uh, might be needed. But I think that's what I, my next steps would be is just to get more data. I want to look at her chest. I want to look at her belly. Um, um, what about you, Doc? What are your thoughts? I'm not an ad. I'm with you. I'm with you every step of the way there. All right. So uh, her CT scan of abdomen pelvis with IV contrast showed no um, acute findings, no evidence of cirrhosis, no evidence of any clots or any filling defects. Uh, her CT chest uh, showed no pleural effusions, no parenchymal disease, but some mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Is this to me or to you? I think it's you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, gosh, you know, I think, um, I guess what to make of the finding of the mediastinal lymphadenopathy here. Um, I think my like intuitive type one thinking brain is like mediastinal lymphadenopathy in this background, um, going to invoke um, uh, uh, the prominent diet or going to invoke 
malignancy here. Um, but one of the things that I'm noticing here is that um, uh, many of the malignancies that we may expect to cause SIADH, for example, lung cancer, um, we don't necessarily see here on the CT scan. Um, and so I think seeing that sort of illness script discordance here, I think it's forcing me to slow down a little bit and say, okay, well, what are some of the other disease categories that can cause lymphadenopathy? And I fall back on that I made mnemonic um, and thinking about infections, malignancies, the possibility of, uh, of underlying autoimmune diseases, and then certain drugs and certain endocrinopathies can do it. Um, I think the, um, the TSH is still in the back of my mind as an endocrinopathy, but honestly is not, uh, that, that hypothesis is not modified in any way by the mediastinal lymphadenopathy, because I don't think about lymph nodes or, or mediastinal nodes as being a prominent feature of that, of that syndrome. And so then within the infection malignancy and autoimmune disease category, infections that can cause um, mediastinal lymphadenopathy could be uh, usually atypical disseminated infections, but we might expect to see lymphadenopathy in many other places in those scenarios. For example, HIV can have scattered lymph nodes in many, um, in many places. Disseminated TB, we could see scattered lymph nodes in many other places. The autoimmune diseases that can do it include things like include things like sarcoid, um, and then also um, some of the other connective tissue diseases, but sarcoid is probably our characteristic one. And then the, really many of the different cancers within the thoracic space can make their way there, whether it's lung cancer that's small enough to not be picked up in the parenchyma, but has metastasized to the lymph nodes at this point. Um, breast cancer we talked about previously, and I feel like in my mind, I usually think about breast cancer going to axillary nodes first, but um, I honestly don't know if there are lymph node pathways for which new breast malignancies could go straight to could go straight to the mediastinal nodes. And then certainly thinking about the possibility of a non-solid organ malignancy um, uh, as manifesting in the, the, the lymph nodes, particularly something, something like a lymphoma. Um, so I guess that's kind of where my brain is going. I, I mean, I feel like my uh, cancer still probably reigns highest given the risk factors that you mentioned and the real absence of a prominent inflammatory signature. But I'm curious, what are you making of this? At least we know that there's something that we can sample now. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, especially like the loculated effusion. Um, kind of uh, like we didn't hear a story of someone who is like, you know, having more anorexia, like losing weight, not eating. Because my thought was like, you know, kind of esophageal, gastric cancers, those things I would worry about in this patient as well. Uh, but I agree. I think this is the person that uh, I would think about. I worry about that pericardial effusion being like kind of exudative in nature. And within that, uh, as you mentioned, given kind of the lack of like kind of chronic inflammation, un unless we count the hypoalbuminemia as a sign. Though I think for me, it's like malignancy is number one. Um, I think like the infection autoimmune diseases, um, of course, can have uh, as, like, you know, I think I saw sarcoid being mentioned uh, with hyaluronephalinopathy as well. But yes, I do worry about cancer, um, specifically like a GI malignancy um, or a lymphoma that can go anywhere and do anything. The SIADH part, I agree. I don't have the best way of tying it together other than maybe stress or a malignancy that. I don't commonly associate with SIADH, uh, but I would go, yeah, I would, I would go down the cancer path, right? With you, friend. All right, love. Teach us, your cases are also, my friend, always full of learning and fantastic. Thank you. There's no this other is a really great cases. Case. Uh, so we um, went to go talk to radiology and um, these uh, could not be sampled via CT scan, but could be sampled via endobronchial ultrasound. So pulmonary took a patient to um, the bronchoscopy suite and ended up sampling the, um, the nodes and got pathology on it. Um, I guess that's, are we, we're off on time, right? Do you want me to just tell you what it, what it ended up being? Yes, please. Sounds good. Um, and the case is not actually over. I've been following the patient ever since I stopped, but it ended up being a, uh, a squamous cell carcinoma and all the other tests since then to figure out where it came from uh, have been inconclusive at this time. And I mean, my, uh, I've, been, I've been following this case and I still don't totally understand myself how the lower extremity, like what that has to do with anything. Um, it doesn't really fit because when I picked up the patient they had the effusion, 
I didn't know what, and we pan scanned and found the lymph nodes, but I still can't put everything together. If you guys have thoughts, let me know about how lower extremity edema was the gateway to getting this patient a cancer diagnosis in the mediastinal lymph nodes. Yeah, no, I, I'm blown away. I uh, love, thank you so much for presenting that. I don't know if I have much to add. Um, you're like one of the most thoughtful people I know, but I think that, yeah, I wonder like, oh, if the lower extremity edema is actually unrelated or maybe a little, like, maybe the hypoalbuminase is making it worse, but maybe it was like quite actually venous insufficiency that led to that or is it like the hypoalbuminemia I think those are uh, my two uh thoughts was like oh either it's um consequences of the hypoalbuminemia or maybe unrelated um to the malignancy itself but it kind of sounds like the thought is like it's going to sell of unknown ideology um as of now uh, unknown primary um well, wow, which is quite unfortunate. Jack, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think the like to draw arrows between these different findings here, the hypoalbuminemia seems like it's the most likely um, modifier of the lower extremity edema, um, like kind of on that chain of reasoning. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that. Yeah, I certainly don't have a better, a better explanation here. I think like one reflection on it is. Um, it's interesting, like, I think I want some, something that I have found myself becoming very curious about, um, particularly in the ER over the course of last year is like symptoms that have been going on for some time, um, like how, um, how that threshold gets crossed to finally present or come, come into the hospital. Um, and just the ways in which, um, yeah, I don't know, I just feel like there are some times where things, things have been going on for some time and there's something else that changes that make, that we may not even be able to articulate is making us feel different. Um, but that sometimes ends up being, um, a, a major driver to seek care. So, um, yeah, I would, I, I wonder if there's been other things brewing that maybe just haven't risen to the level of like above the line of being like a primary part of, of her syndrome, but that was like contributing to this edema now becoming a lot more, a lot more worrisome. But yeah, it's a really, um, it's a tough one to go together because I feel like, um, what was I going to say? Like could like increase free water retention in the setting of SIAD plus hypoalbuminemia? Could like that be like a one plus one equals lower extremity edema equation? Maybe, but I don't, I, like that's all just hand waving this um, and I have no degree of certainty about that. Yeah, beautifully said. Love and thank you so, 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 so much. It's a one so great to see you and love nerding out about medicine with you. Uh, and we're ready for our teaching points. A great case, Lev, and great discussion, uh, Charmin and Jack. So uh, for the teaching points, we started with the chief complaint of lower extremity edema, and we said that there are three major organs that can be involved and cause it, uh, and it's the heart, the liver, and the kidney, but we should always keep an open mind and consider other differential differentials like um, the, the, the thyroid and uh, mixed edema. It's probably chronic venous insufficiency, and we should look in the uh, patient's history for um, other medications like amlodipine and gamepentane, and it can also be caused by central venous obstruction. Um, in the past medical history, all, uh, so, so, sorry, in the social history, we also uh, talks about a significant smoking history that kind of clued us in uh, in a malignancy. It can be due to um, cancer and that can cause lymphatic obstruction and therefore lower lower extremity edema or due to vascular and adrenal complications be, uh, caused by smoking. Um, Jack told us that in the lower extremes edema, we should focus on two areas in the physical exam, and that's the neck and the abdomen. Uh, in the neck, we should look for uh, elevated, uh, elevated jugular venous pressure, and this will clue us in cardiac causes or SITs. In the abdomen, that would uh, clues us in hepaticosis. Neither of these were present in our patients, and uh, the lower, the sorry, the um, the edema induced by renal cause is also typically accompanied by hypertension, and neither of these were present in this patient. Uh, the labs revealed hypoalbuminemia that can explain the lower extremity edema and can be due to 
decrease production in inflammation or uh, liver disease, and it can also be caused by genetic causes or increased loss, like in protein losing enteropathies, vascular leak, or nephrotic syndrome. The patient also has had hyponatremia, and to approach hyponatremia, we should next check serum osmolality, urine osmolality, and urine sodium. Um, this patient's picture looked, looked, looked like sciata, and that can be caused by either hypothyroidism, medications, or malignancy, primarily the, the malignancy of the lung. Uh, he also had pericardial effusion, and uh, it was first this described in the bedside ultrasound. Charmin said that we should always get a formal CTE to rule out temp, uh, tamponade, and uh, pericardial effusion can be caused by hematologic malignancies like lymphoma or thoracic malignancies like breast cancer, and it can also be like post-MI, uh, like Dressler's, or in an underlying chronic kidney disease or hypothyroidism. The patients next had the mediastinal lymphadenopathies that can be caused by malignancies or infections or autoimmune. And uh, then the biopsy showed that it was indeed a malignancy. And we um, we have yet to find the primary. Lev, keep us updated. Thank you so much, Umaima. Thank you so much again, Lev. Um, and uh, yeah, what a, uh, I missed who was scribing today, but I just want to say that, was a, that, a, that is a wall of data. Um, so thank you so much for doing it. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing y'all again soon. Uh, thanks everybody for hanging in for a few minutes over. Um, it was well worth uh, the case and the learning were well worth, uh, I hope the extra time. Uh, we'll see y'all later. Bye y'all, thanks. <laughs>